Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, so the next panel um, is on creating AI value deployment, measurement and AI ethics. Um, I'd like to introduce Nick Patience, who is Head of Research AI at 451 Research, part of S&P Global, um, who's going to introduce the wonderful panellists, so I don't have to. Uh, yeah, please go. go. Great. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, um, we're here to address some of the issues around um, creating value, uh, what, yeah, in AI value, what that actually means in practice, um, in getting AI-driven applications into production, into the hands of people, while also being able to uh, measure their performance, um, prevent any misuse of them, and guard against bias and, and other built-in prejudices. As I said, my name is Nick Patience. I was the founder of a, a technology analyst company called 451 Research about 20 years ago. Uh, we've been part of S&P Global uh, for the last two years. Um, and one thing we do every year is we run a few, well, a lot of surveys um, of uh, AI practitioners. We also do it in other areas like IoT and security, but, but I, I'm, I'm in charge of the AI bit. And just the first couple of few data points which I might just throw out there, we may come back to these. Um, we found in a, in a survey we published in the summer, on average, um, 30, nearly two in five, 39% of ML projects in proof of concept are abandoned at that point. Um, and we find some of the challenges um, that, that most strongly correlate with that project abandonment rates are accessing and integrating of data, um, model explainability, and governance of data or, or AI systems. So they, those are the kind of top four things that are causing the, the project abandonment. Um, on a more kind of positive note, maybe, we found 69% um, of enterprises we surveyed, and this is a survey of 700 um, organizations in the US and, and UK, 69% track ROI on their AI initiatives, and of the industries we looked at, telecommunication had the highest percentage of enterprises tracking ROI, and retail the lowest. Um, um, it was about 82% of, of respondents in telecom said they tracked it. That's partly because I think te telecom's been using this for a very, very long time. Um, and the anticipated ROI, level of ROI varies by industry segment and by region. Um, the, but the, the overwhelming majority of all enterprises was 94%. Expect to see some net gain from the AI initiatives, with 67% of them expecting to reach that ROI within a year and 92% within two years. So you may think that might be a fairly optimistic bunch, but it's, it's, it's a fairly, we, think, we know it's a representative sample um, of what's going on. So with that, I'll just introduce the panel, so starting at, at the end, um, Dr. Alison Gardner. Alison lectures at Keele University in data science and is the program director of, for the data science degree apprenticeship. She's a co-founder of Women Leading a in AI, CEO of AI Aware and for Humanity Fellow. Her research is focused on algorithmic bias, gender and computing, um, AI ethics and governance of AI and health tech. And she works on various standards committees, uh, including the UK National Committee for ART01 Artificial Intelligence Standards. Um, she also acts as a consultant on ethical design of autonomous intelligence systems. Um, next to her is Ghislaine uh, Safak. Uh, Ghislaine works for um, a, a consultancy called Elemental Concept. He's head of data science at Elemental Concept, where he leads the organization's AI strategy. This includes overseeing, uh, overseeing the company's work in leveraging the latest advancements in AI to help clients create value from their data and auditing AI systems developed by third parties. Prior to this, he would held data-related positions across several industries and worked as an academic at the French National Institute for Research and Auto Automation at the University of Lyon. And he also published a book called T T Towards Sustainable Artificial Intelligence. Um, next, we have Dr. Uh, Wishuan Zhang, who's the CEO and founder of Boltzbit. Um, he has been passionate about AI since the beginning of his research career in 2010. Um, since he, beginning his PhD study at University of Edinburgh, he had been publishing on the fundamental topics of the machine learning, machine learning called Boltzmann machines, and approximate inference at top uh, global conferences such as NeurIPS. Um, and the core of the Boltzbit AI technology that his company has is established on his research that has been published at the International Conference of Machine Learning. And next, nearest to me is James Coveney. James is the head of data science at Cash Plus Bank and has been with the company since 2015. He has over 12 years experience in retail banking, uh, nine years in analytics and data science and previously worked in diverse range of roles at Barclays, Lloyds and Halifax. So I've got a few questions and obviously um, we, we're happy to take questions towards the end. Um, and so I'll start with you, James, um, as, you're, as you're nearest to me. So, you're heavily involved in applying machine learning within you know, your role, your business at Cash Plus. Um, first of all, I think it'd be useful to explain what Cash Plus does, but also I'm curious how you define 
um, commercial success of a data science project there. Uh, yep, so Cash Plus uh, Bank are a challenger bank in the UK. Uh, predominantly, um, we look at SME um, accounts, and um, we also have a consumer book, um, as well as sort of credit cards and overdrafts and things like that. So pretty much just a normal bank, but not that big. Um, and yeah, so in, in regards, with regards to your question, I think the key thing really is to um, engage people within the business from the beginning. So for us, that's always around, uh, if we're trying to beat another model, then, you know, by how much and, you know, what sort of level of performance do we need? Um, if, uh, if we're trying to solve like a new problem, then we really just try and get as much detail as we can. So that involves things like, you know, how uh, do we want to focus on a certain type of decision? Um, do we need, is rank ordering really important on the model? Or is it simply, you know, we need to detect as much as possible? So there, there are lots of different use cases. And um, I think the key really is to have people involved as early as possible. Um, and within Cash Plus, we have quite a good understanding throughout the wider business of machine learning and AI because we've been using it a long time. And so I find it's quite easy within our business to, uh, to get that because people understand broadly how machine learning works and the kind of outcomes they should expect. Um, Whereas, you know, in, in other instances, I've seen that be quite difficult because you have to try and explain exactly what machine learning is to people before you even get to that point. But um, for me, yeah, the, the key is to make sure that everyone necessary is involved from the outset uh, so that you have that kind of buy-in. Um, and, you know, even if, the, even if the, um, the project is just around, like, let's see if it works, they should understand that and agree that maybe it won't. And that's the outcome, and that's fine. And you know, we have that sometimes as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Ghislaine, um, we're looking here about how to um, scale AI uh, within organizations. You have a lot of experience in helping organizations do that, but from the outside in, because uh, you know, in your consultancy role. Can you, can you explain um, in part um, how an outsider's point of view can help, and, and have you got any examples um, you can give us? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, the thing is, companies are trying really hard um, to meet standards or to develop AI systems which meet the society in which they, they operate. One thing we have noticed is that if you talk about scalability in AI, it has to be through consistent processes, processes within the organization. But those processes have to also be consistent outside of the, of the organization and the environment in which they, they operate. So what happens is that even though companies are trying to develop their own internal understanding of concepts like fairness, privacy, and so on, if they are not shared within the ecosystem, that doesn't me mean anything. So the key thing is um, standards, for example, can help define those words, those concepts, so that organizations know exactly what they are looking for. If you take the case of fairness still, one thing can be fair by one metric and then be unfair by the other metric. So those are very complex terms, and we have to understand in which context they are valid and how to apply them in, in practice. And companies, really, especially small ones, or companies who are not tech-driven, they need to understand those systems. They need help from standards. And the other aspect is, um, is uh, regulations. Regulations will play a key role in the sense that organizations are trying to adopt best practices, but there's nothing um, forcing them to do so in the sense that best practices are expensive to implement. If you want suddenly to make your models uh, explainable, so, so to speak, then it's a lot of money that you have to put into it. It's time consuming. So from an organization's perspective, it's not really that interesting to do so unless you have to. So one way of doing so, one way of, thought of having companies do so is customers asking for it. We have seen customers ask for privacy where organizations are now pushing a bit more into that. But if they don't, who else have to help those companies or those customers get their voice out? The government has to step in and bring a bit of few regulations to help them navigate through the possibilities that are, are available to them. Yeah, and I think we're going to see AI will become a regulated sector. I mean, we're seeing it in, you know, in the EU, aren't we, with the, with the publication of the of the, the EC's paper in April, we're seeing it with the, to say the UK and the US is a bit more fragmented and obviously we're seeing it in China as well. So it's, it's, it, it will happen, it's inevitable, so we'll all have to get used to it. Definitely. 
Um, which one? Um, so as AI matures, one of the main issues organizations are facing is explainability. We were talking a little bit about fairness and bias there. Um, yeah, exactly. What, what stage do you think we are at with in terms of uh, being able to explain predictions made by models in non, uh, to non-technical people? Uh, I think we are really getting there, by the way, I like at the very beginning of the stage. Right. Like uh, at BossBeat, actually, we aim to solve a lot of this kind of uh, soft AI challenges rather than like uh, to finish the task and uh, with good predictions. Because now we, we already have quite powerful AI infrastructures and technologies. So for any simple tasks that you have the label, you have enough data, pretty much you just uh, throw the resources, you can solve it. But for some issues like ex explainability or scaling with multitasks uh, to understand how AI interacts with human, this is still a very new challenge, actually, not only in industry, but also in research academia and also like uh, industrial tech research institute. Um, like BossFit, we also do a lot of research on this. But our vision to solve these kind of things is to um, build up like a generative AI. So the generative means basically you formulate your AI not for specific tasks, but to simulate data, mm -hmm. because data is kind of the uh, common programming interface between human and machines. So if if machine not only do do let's, let's see um, user credit level evaluation, but also can generate a synthetic user profile with the correct uh, credit level then you can ask the machine when they do the prediction, can you also simulate uh, the user profile? So, uh, so that can channel as a way to explain why machine do such a decision. So this can help to get a human involved in this uh, decision making process. Because for a lot of things like ex ex explainability and fairness, at the end of the day, it's very subjective uh, matters. Mm. So, it's not possible to expect a machine can solve it or any single human institute can solve it. So it's, it's really to get AI to be able to interact with human in a more human and like understandable way. I think that would be the way to, to solve this challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at a lot of, um, I'm in my role as an analyst, I, I see products at, sometimes at fairly early stages, and there's some, some of the things that still look like they're at fairly early stages after two or three years are explainability tools. And some of them are things that only a data scientist could love or even understand. And you know, sometimes, sometimes it's easier when you're talking about computer vision and you can plot pixels on a, on a, on a, on a picture and say, that's why we're, use, we're calling this a tree. But sometimes it, it, with, with other things, with other kinds of predictions, it's, I think it's extremely, extremely difficult sometimes. Yes, like a, one example we, um, we developed is like a cancer image classification. Mm -hmm. So we do this uh, typical classification uh, like all the other deep learning or machine learning problem do. Uh, but also at the same time, because we are uh, generative AI, we can also synthetic the uh, cancer image given the label. So you can have a, a normal patient's image and you see uh, if this image is a cancer image and then you can ask our AI to generate a synthetic cancer image is similar to the uploaded image. So you can visually see how the image changed. And then this gave not only the doctor, but the patients some idea, OK, if this is cancer, how it looks like. You know, because we have seen a lot of challenges of this kind of a different, uh, uh, this kind of uh, healthcare, uh, this kind of machine, they are very complicated. And all the new, gen new generations maybe have some slightly visual artifacts that can affect the decision making of doctors. And when you have such explainable, this kind of uh, or simulative uh, capability of AI, and then actually you can, you can help a lot on this kind of issues. Mm. Yeah. Alison, so um, I know your, your research is very much focused on addressing bias and, and mitigating it. Um, I'm, I'm, well, should really, if you could talk a little bit about what you're working on, because I'm sure you're seeing a lot of different different approaches to this and uh, obviously if you have any comments on what you heard so far I'd love to hear that as well but if you could just explain first of all what, where your focus is. Um, originally my focus was looking at bias within the algorithmic model itself and then within the data but my interest has expanded to look at the ent entire life cycle right from um, development of the business use case and the problem that you're trying to solve um, and that was 
was generated by looking at some grant applications where people got, were getting really into reinforcement learning and running around looking for problems to apply reinforcement learning to, and that's the wrong way round. And obviously, in the type of business case that you want and the problems you want to solve, there's bias in there because you don't have um, diverse teams. Um, another area, again, beyond the model in the wider e um, ecosystem is post-deployment of that model uh, because bias can... can come in at that point in the decisions you make. Human decision making is involved in the whole process. So when you deploy a model, is it properly tested? What's your interface? What are your operational procedures around that model? And how does the operator interact with it? And explainability is really important here, because if you don't understand how that process works and, and how the key decision making um, thresholds around that model, and you are having to make a decision, a diagnosis, for example, based upon that, um, and you don't understand how the recommendation has been made to you, you can make mistakes. And, and understanding also why the wider, um, you know, the, the board members and the business leaders, when you're doing operational decisions, um, is also important and can impact on your machines. So if, you, um, if you don't evaluate it regularly, there, there can be real issues. So the classic example that I often give is a hip fracture um, image de um, detection tool to, to detect image. When they looked into the explainability of that tool, they found that it was age and the fact that a mobile scanner was used and that determined that it actually pretty much ignored the image that the scanner was taking. Now, if you didn't understand that and there was an operational decision to go, right, we're going to get rid of mobile scanners, you know, we're just going to have them all on, on site, that's going to impact on the accuracy of that of that AI model. And if you don't know that, you may not choose to reevaluate the outputs from that model. So there's a whole host of issues post deployment and how you make sure it is operationalized and governed and you maintaining your algorithmic impact assessments and evaluation. And another area I'm very interested in is, as well as automation bias and defaulting to the, um, to the algorithm, is the long term impact on work and skills and the issue of skills fade, where people become very used to it. Because we know from the aviation industry, when, a, um, a, when AI becomes a real failure and real damage comes, is in a crisis situation and it's that interaction with the human and the artificial intelligence completely gets confused and that is when you get plane crashes and you know and high levels of death so this is a high risk scenario so my interest is broadened out to, to you know, either side of the model of decision making you know ecosystem if you like yeah, because I guess what you, we do spend quite a lot of time thinking about the, the, the training cycle and that, that element of, of you know, introducing bias, whether it's through the algorithm or through, or through the data. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's good. I always think the aircraft, aircraft industry may end up being a bit of a model for AI because yeah, there's a regulated industry which has huge safety issues and largely it works. And you know, not saying it's, it's not exactly analogous, but it's there's some, some maybe similar. And just yeah, just pick up on a couple of things. I think it's, it's I totally agree with everything you're saying there, Alison. I think it's also really important to distinguish between explaining the algorithm and explaining the decision. Um, so you know, your example there, obviously, the inputs you're talking about are relatively straightforward. Um, you know, whereas in financial services and in a lot of uh, you know in industry generally. Sometimes the inputs are so abstracted from kind of reality, I suppose, that simply explaining the way the algorithm works doesn't really mean anything. If you're aggregating uh, transactional spend over a period of time and then comparing that to something else and creating a ratio and converting that into something else, then it is meaningless to a, to another per, to a sort of end user. Um, and th there's a couple of challenges really, well, I guess particularly within banking where we're looking at, say, financial crime or fraud. If you completely explain a decision, it's going to drive a change in behaviour. Um, so you, there's got to be a kind of a balance struck between explainability and, I guess, sort of not compromising the original purpose of what you're trying to do. And I think that's a really complex area. Um, and, um, you know, similarly, where you're talking about mo uh, monitoring after the fact, which I, I think is incredibly important, um, and even more so, again, where the, I guess, the recipient of the AI, so to speak, is, is not a passive in, in the process. So in financial crime, for example, again, you know, there's a kind of cat and mouse game going on there where people will adapt their behavior based on when they get caught and when they don't. And so, um, you know, as you're, you know, if you're constantly retraining, you, 
um, you kind of get in this cycle where you're you're doing that, and then also, you know, for example, like operations agents, like humans within the process, may close accounts based on the original decision from an AI model, and then that feeds back into the retrain, and we end up in this loop where we just perpetuate some kind of bias or we perpetuate some form of like decision. Um, so it's it's so important for um, people within a company, you know, at, at every level to understand what a decision means. If they're given a score of 999 out of 1,000, that doesn't mean it's definitely fraud or def definitely criminal. It just means it's as likely, you know, it's very likely within the parameters of this model, which maybe is only 30%, right? You know, so um, stuff like that, I think, is, is super important. And um, I guess the final thing really is just when we're talking about, and I'm sure we'll get onto this, like ethics and, and bias and things like that, they're moral rather than mathematical concepts broadly. What's fair to one person is, is unfair to another, otherwise politics wouldn't exist, right? It's effectively the whole point of, of that. And, um, you know, so sometimes when we try and throw maths at those problems, all we end up doing is just um, sort of like missing the whole point, right? Which is the data and the wider structures around it. Mm. Um, just Lane, um, the, the, the AI understanding gap, as it were, between the development, the AI development team and other business stakeholders usually um, results in some sort of either misaligned objectives that then lead to, uh, can lead to project failures. Um, you've obviously seen this, you've, you've worked with a lot of clients, presumably, that have some of these issues, and presumably part of your role is to mitigate against this, but how do you how do, you do that? How do you get those objectives aligned? Yeah, uh, it goes back to the whole process, as uh, James was saying earlier. Uh, understanding whether a project is actually viable for the company or not. Mm -hmm. And that also, that means that before actually starting a project, what we would typically do is design a vision for that project. That is, you have to define how it's going to be developed and what is going to be the output for the, for the organization. So they understand that even if at some point it doesn't succeed, it's still it still brings some benefits to the organization. Because what happens today is, in most companies, what will happen is that data scientists or the data professionals will just develop something, and then ultimately, the management isn't aware of it. They don't give it the sign-in. So that leads to the project not being a successful project. It just failed. So how to approach this is uh, basically make sure that the business business-oriented people understand what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to achieve, and how we're achieving them. They don't need to understand the algorithms that they don't have any interest in those, but they have to understand how it's going to benefit the organization, either in terms of uh, returning, either in terms of uh, bringing much more, more cash or giving them more visibility or more viability. Because we have seen over the past few years that even social, um, uh, social absent, absent, absent acceptance is very key thing for organizations. If people do not like your organizations, they won't use your products, especially if there are competing products outside the, uh, out there. So a really important thing is to make sure that the system we're developing somehow meets the organization's way of seeing things. You will see organizations say, we take privacy very seriously. We take fairness very seriously. So while you're developing your systems, how do you actually integrate those in the development is a key challenge. And putting in place practices and processes to ensure that you actually get that at the end is a very important thing. Mm -hmm. And also in, in, involve training your staff, involve training your staff, as well as providing them the support and leadership they need to, to achieve that. This is actually a very, this is in reality a very expensive process. So it has to be an organization-wide buy-in for this to work in, in practice. Yeah, I guess it's one of these, the kind of, it's become a bit of a cliche, isn't it, in, in technology industry of, of getting the business and the IT to talk to each other. And it kind of was, it was annoying that it didn't happen. And now it's kind of with, with AI machine learning and deep learning, it's, it's so important because it could, it could be really dangerous if we're not, I mean, you know, obviously, especially when you get into regulated industries and there's auditors involved and things like that, um, you know, when they, you're, they're so far removed from the data science team, is that how do they, you know, they're saying, well, how does, this, how does this fit with our, our, what we have to do here from an auditing perspective? So, yeah, it's interesting stuff. Um, Alison, um, just 
look, we're going to look beyond the technology to people. We're going to come back to the we try and talk to you about more geeky stuff uh, for a second. But let's stick with with um, looking beyond the technology and focusing on the people involved, in particularly some of those less celebrated roles than data scientists um, and, and ML engineers. I'm thinking of the people working behind the scenes labeling data um, to give us all that all those great label data sets, train models. How sustainable? do you think that model is, and what issues do you think that, that kind of model um, raises? Perhaps I shouldn't use the word model, but you know, business model, I mean more. Yeah, um, I might just veer a little away from that. Sure. I, I, I've, I'm, there's been a lot of talk today about responsible innovation and the government governance, and a lot of sort of you know, very fantastic comments made. But I mean, I was in a meeting the other day with a very high level organization that has a real remit to do no harm. And, um, and they're telling me that they have a real concern because they're buying off-the-shelf systems uh, for HR, for example, um, and going, right, and then deploying it. And, you know, and there's an awful lot of that. I was in another organization for um, a, a rather large predictive um, policing platform that they wanted to use, and they had bought, and they wanted to use an off-the-shelf emotion detector as part of this predictive policing model with no understanding of it and these are all off the, off the shelf other ones that are natural language processing and they're using wikipedia as a corpus and this is in an an, an, an a bias um project algorithmic bias project and yet they are constantly doing these same things and again talking about understanding the business question and the business leaders you know there has to be honesty there you know within the health sector we want to be more efficient so we can deliver health care quicker to our customers and be more accurate no it's not it's to be cheaper it's to maybe cut your staffing costs you know, and, and again, talking about skills fade, you know, you start reducing, if you depend on this algorithm and says, oh, it's got this high level of accuracy, okay, we can get cheaper staff. We don't need the clinicians and the consultants to do the diagnosis. Maybe we'll have the physician's assistants doing it. And then we move down and we move down and we move down. And this has happened in, for example, the ch child um, care algorithms that are out there, that Allegheny child care pro, um, algorithm started and several councils in the UK implemented these systems and have now very quickly withdrawn them um, and abandoned them because they found that they were biased but they were using instead of experienced social workers they were downskilling to just 18 year olds doing just training on, on, the, on the algorithm and the operational procedures about that with this great big risk red risk score that's very difficult to say no and having to churn through this material very quickly to meet targets actually the business case and what the you know the customer wants they have to be truly, truly honest, and everybody deploying that system and working with them has to be honest about it. And again, going back to your question about the huge implications around here. So I saw a picture the other day of, of um, a large room where people are just sat there all day, every day, just labeling data, labeling data. And I did a project, I'll be very quick, um, a while back on a, with a very ethical organization, one I respect, I don't work very often, um, you know, I'm very choosy who I work with, and um, but I analysed their algorithm, and they, again, there was issues with their quality control of their labelling, and who are the people doing the labelling, and what are their biases and their unconscious bias? If you're assessing somebody for the, you know, into the six classifications of darkness of skin or lightness of skin, and assessing whether they've got heavy makeup or light makeup, that's actually cultural. And, and so how are those labels defined and have you assessed that and what's your quality control? So if you are buying an off-the-shelf system and it is a highly labeled data set, are you aware of the labeling protocols and the quality assurance around that to make sure that that process isn't biased? I very much doubt it because often this information doesn't travel with the data set. I'm a big fan of Tim Gebru's and et al's data sheets. And, and model cards, you know, this type of information should come. And if you are procuring a system and intend to deploy it, you should know and you should ask these questions. Um, so it is, we knew a while back with Google that their warehouses of, da of data labelers and the, and the working conditions of those were a real concern. So we have a hidden class of people now involved in this. Um, you know, don't worry about AI not coming to take your jobs. The jobs are there, but maybe they are not of the skill and, and quality and the experience that you may actually want to have. So is it sustainable? 
not if you were to do it really well with good quality assurance and, and that area does need severe looking at with regards to governance you know and how that labeling process works and that information should travel with it not just that it's labeled yeah great um, and one more question uh, to the panel before we, we open it up for questions if you have any we try and, um, so I know you've done a lot of cutting-edge research in your in your career and I was just curious about any in particular areas that interest you and also um, with deep learning um, what additional challenges does that throw up? And Alison was talking about the post-deployment issues around you know, um, you know, um, trustworthy AI and explainability. Deep learning is a whole other ball of wax, as it were. I mean, what kind of other challenges does that throw up? So just curious about you know, the cutting edge stuff that interests you and then the deep learning stuff. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of like a problem we discussed today, they are very challenging for deep learning. Um, and actually, deep learning is very interesting today. Uh, I mean, these two days I have been to some talks and. I really pick up this attitude that people think still, although people know uh, data-driven AI, but actually in peop most people's mind, AI is still offshore solution that somehow it just don't work. But now it's actually, it's, it's not the same. When we're talking about AI now, it's pretty much deep learning, data-driven stuff. Mm. So it is not just something you can just do it offshore. And the deep learning itself contribute to this problem because deep learning, um, mainly people now use in the industry is single task and it's mainly human labeled driven data so this causes a lot of these kind of problems and um, how you label this data it is not a uh, just some human expert like the old good fashion ai some expert knows how it works and code it up it automate it's reliable if you don't like it you can ask the expert why they can explain it but now with deep learning everything becomes dark box and people pick up it and use it and figure out the problem later and then all oh, they pick up the, the, the wrong problem because they have to label it and then the, the, the wrong problem, the wrong label end up the failure of the uh, AI project. And all of this kind of stuff actually are calling the current the deep learning, this single task AI development has a lot of problem. It may be promising at the very beginning if you just want to label and cat dog image if you just uh, want to label 100 customers <laughs> if their transaction is wrong or mm -hmm. not. But when it scale up, when the knowledge has to come from some human labeled uh, extra source, it actually becomes very challenging to control it. So I think there's a lot of research now we want to do to solve this, to be able to let uh, AI to, exp uh, to explain their decision and get involved uh, at the deploying phase, at the uh, training phase, at the data preparation phase, to really be able to interact with the end user and keep updating mm. from this. But so far, the deep learning in industry now is still staying at a very single, uh, single task. Very narrow. Code label, yes. Yeah. yeah, we are trying to really move toward that direction. There's a lot of research um, put in, into this domain, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it's still beginning of it. I mean, both speed, we try a lot of this kind of stuff, but it's very challenging. Basically, you are trying to solve a lot of problems at the same time, not only the labeling prediction, but also how to explain yourself and how to validate the model itself if the data is right. Because typically, our AI, by default, can detect if a data, it is the normal training data or not. For example, it's very likely at both speed, we train our fraud detection on some public sector data that it does not fit into your bank. But our AI can always read the flag to say it's outlier, uh, the data I don't recognize. So in that case, you say, OK, sorry, both with your AI is great, but it seems to always complain my data is not the correct one. Mm -hmm. Then we can figure out, we can realize it. But the, unfortunately, most of the current deep learning, they don't do that. They just the take the input as it is and then give you label. They never say, no, I don't understand it or something wrong. At least, I think if the current deep learning can say, OK, your deployment phase data is not the same as the training data, that's already a great help. Yeah. Got it. Does anybody have any questions for our panel? We have a microphone here. We do? No? No? OK. Um, Got but five, three, four minutes left, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, if there's any particular issues you want to pick up on, I'm, I'm interested also in skill shortages and you know ones you may see. I don't know if James, you have any examples in your in your organisation or or anybody else that you see 
um, and how that's morphed from um, one, well, I'll tell you what I see in our surveys. We see data scientists were always top, and now they're kind of, is a mix of data scientists, ML engineers, cloud architects. As, as AI a and ML um, becomes more, not, it's not mainstream yet, but becomes more of the kind of classic um, you know, software development process, there's lots of other related skills that we're finding shortages of. I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's two kinds of skill shortages, shortages really. We've got the kind of, uh, your, your historic data scientist would be someone, you know, who is maybe very good at Python, you know, they're modeling, maths, blah, blah, blah. So, but they, they maybe don't really have much experience with data, they don't know SQL very well. Um, and then, you know, so they, they develop some model really without thinking about how that's going to fit into a production system. Like, is it, is it like realistic to compute that? in you know, under a second or something like that. That's, that's a big uh, issue, um, I think, in data science generally, is like trying to get data scientists themselves to understand like, the practicality of like, what's going to happen when this model is deployed. Um, that's, that's kind of by the by, in a sense, because you can get around that you know, with working with other teams and sort of um, talking to data scientists, making them understand those sort of things. But the bigger problem for me, I think, is a lack of understanding within like, risk functions within companies, like compliance and risk and all that kind of area. Um, you know, most senior people in that area are obviously older and predate a lot of this uh, technology, or maybe they didn't really get involved with it because everyone thought credit risk was totally fine using a logistic regression because it's apparently completely explainable. Um, so you've got uh, like this whole kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, suite of people here across the industry who don't really understand machine learning or AI and are trying to regulate it and work um, fit it within their risk kind of controls and you know that's that's definitely a, a problem and I think the only way you get around that really is just to to like try and teach them basically um, and understand like the conceptual elements so you know basically at a minimum that um, all most machine learning in practice within banking in particular and most industries is just supervised machine learning so if they understand that you know, if the data's got some bias or unfairness or, you know, um, unequal distribution in it, then the model will just reflect that. And as they understand that basic concept, at least, then they can kind of get part of the way to um, sort of doing their job in that, in that sense. But, um, yeah, I think it's a very, very difficult one because, um, you know, they're obviously not going to become data scientists, but they need to know a lot about the the way machine learning works and the kind of risks involved, because if you don't understand it conceptually, you can't assess the risk of it. If I a minute, um, I really like that question. Um, if you look at the data science level six apprenticeship plug, um, what they now, they do require the technical skills, which in the old days used to be called the hard skills, um, but they also require the human skills, which in the old days used to be called the soft skills that was gendered and biased in its own way, so I, ch change, I changed the language. And they do require them now to have good communication skills, they do require them to understand risk management, the compliance, the governance and the regulation. They want you to be more rounded individual. You can't have the situation where you've got your techie in his, you know, in his black t-shirt, you know, you know, doing his stuff and not really engaging. I mean, you know, those stereotypes have long, long gone if they ever actually existed. And, and it's all about this, this holistic approach to, to developing ethical data science and AI projects. And I will just close very quickly by saying it's very rare I don't disagree and find something to argue with with a panel. Um, and I thought we were doing really well until you pronounced SQL SQL, because that's... <laughs> <laughs> and then we fell out. <laughs> That's an ongoing argument I have with my apprentices. <laughs> great. Well, um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, thanks to the panel for those, those great insights.